So hello, today I'm at St Nicholas's Church in Canoodon in Essex. I'd like to talk to you about the history of the church and the village here. So Canoodon is a village in Essex. It's two miles from Ashingdon and three miles from Pagglesham. Canoodon itself sits on a hill making it the highest coastal village in Essex. Now the elevation here is 30 metres or 98 feet in old money and today's population is about is around 1,250. Now Canudan's history is incredibly varied. Around 6,000 BC the woodlands here were cleared. Some of the original flint axe heads were found and displayed in today's Southend Museum. The high ground would have made a settlement through the Bronze and Iron Ages. Now during the Roman occupation oyster harvesting and salt production took place here. Now during 1712 18 Roman burial urns were dug up here meaning a fair sized settlement was here. It would be the Saxons who gave Canudan its unusual name for Carna was the leader here and Canudan simply meant Carna's people of the hill. Now by 1015, Canute the Great had sieged London. England's king, Ethelred the Unready, had died, leaving England's future in the hands of his son, Edmund Ironside. Now the Danes, whilst moored in the Thames, declared that Canute their king. And over the next six months, Edmund and Canute battled it out, each time the Saxons were victorious. Now on the 17th of October 1016, Canute and 160 Viking longboats landed right here. When you think that each ship would hold around 40 armed Norsemen, that's about 6,000 men, a formidable force. Now if we look in the distance we can actually see the waterway, the estuary where they landed. That night, Canute's army camped at Canudon's Hill opposite, where we stand now. Edmund Ironside's army, just three miles away, we could see the campfires from Ashenden. It's over there. That night, the smell of smoke, the sound of conversation filled the air. Now what we do know is that next morning Edmund positioned his men four rows deep on Ashingdon's hill. Canute and the Danes approached on the level ground and then Edmund released his men and all day till sundown both armies fought in relentless combat. The Battle of 1016 was described as and all of the flower of England perished here.
Edmund Ironside, his men retreated from Slaughter Field to a place called Battlesbridge, and shortly after the two kings would sign a treaty, whoever would survive would be king of all of England. And just five weeks after the battle, Edmund had died, perhaps from wounds we don't know. But Canute the Great would then rule England, Norway and Denmark for the next 19 years. Now Canudan in 1066 had one Saxon manor, the fane described only as a free man. The settlement was far, fairly large with over 300 sheep. Now before 1086 Canudan would get its own church. This was recorded in the royal court proceedings and the manor was expanded, expanded to include 16 villagers, 15 smallholders, two free men and one slave. Now we are back to a glorious sunshine. Now, Lord of the Manor here was Hugh de Montfort. It was an ally of William the Conqueror. And it was Hugh that supplied 50 ships and 50 knights for William's campaign. And he would be rewarded with 113 English manors, including that of Canudan. That's not a bad investment. We even have a description of the manor here, which was fortified with a double moat. And I read that in 1966 the old manor was levelled and its moats filled in. And a new village built what we see today, which is just over here. Now we jump forward to 1289 when John de Chancellors and his wife Joan held the lands here from Pagglesham to Rochford, from Wakering to Hockley. John would fight against the Scots in 1322 when Robert the Bruce was king there. The Chancellor's family would play a large part in Canudan's history right up until the 1600s. Now in 1381 the Peasants' Revolt swept, swept through here towards London. Now Henry Bolingbroke, aged 14, would marry Mary de Bohun, just 11, at Rochford's Hall. Now Henry Bolingbroke would become Henry IV, the first English monarch since 300 years of Norman rule. He would reintroduce English and Henry and Mary would have a son called Henry and soon he would become Henry V. The connection with Canudan is a simple one for Mary de Bohun's family owned many lands here and it would be Henry V that would build the West Tower to celebrate his victory over the French at Agincourt in 1415. Now in 1425, John Wakering, the Bishop of Norwich, left lands here in Canudan, also a farm and hall, and this was all left to the Church of St Nicholas. And could it be he that paid for the West Tower to celebrate Henry V's victory? Law and order and the church. Now some interesting cases were documented here. For in 1575, John Eckford from Canudan was accused of philandering with a maidservant. Now John boasted that if he had laid lain with her, then he would again. John was ordered to, uh, ordered and asked for God's forgiveness to give two shillings to the poor box. Now in 1586, George Elmer, the George Curate, was accused of being a haunter of alehouses, a drinker and a player of cards and tables. And in 1601, Canudan's vicar, Thomas Newman, was accused of picking the church strongbox. And it's hard to know what really went on, but would certainly add to the village gossip. Now Canudan, like most Essex villages, would suffer from the witch trials from 1563. The witch finder general, Matthew Hopkins, was paid between £6 and £23 to clear a village of accused witches. 
Interestingly, Hopkins never visited Canoodon, but the trial still went ahead. Rose Pye, a local spinster, was accused of be bewitching a 12-month-old child. Rose pleaded, pleaded her innocence and was acquitted, but tragically died in jail, unable to pay the release fee. Now just having a birthmark or a mole and you could face a witch trial. In 1585, Cicely Makin was accused of witchcraft and Cicely was given five years to mend to ways and was then excommunicated from the church here. It's a difficult period in Essex's history. Now we face the village pond. Now Canudan's vicar, Elias Burgess, was a royalist supporter of King Charles I in 1644 and was ejected from his duties here. During the English Civil War, Sir William Campaign owned Lambourne Hall just outside this village and it was Sir William that would lead several regiments of foot soldiers, over a thousand in number, and they fought in great gallantry, three times repulsing, or sorry, three, three times repulsed. Poor Sir William would fight in the Battle of Colchester in 1648. And it was described that he was lying in a hedge with musketeers stand of the body of pikemen against the enemy's horse and it's said that here gallantry gentlemen or gallant gentlemen was killed with a carbine shot and he's buried with 60 of his men at colchester's church now we look upon the Anchor Inn. This is a gem of a pub here in Essex and it's believed to have been extended four times in the 16th century and earlier. Then further builds in the 17th and 18th centuries. Canoodon was for millennium hard to reach by land so once here this inn would be a welcome stop. Now I read in 1791 when the fifth bell of the church was ready to be hauled up to the tower. The locals turned it upside down outside the anchor inn right here and filled it with beer. This was a baptism of sorts and described it as heathenishly or heathenish baptism and copious drinking of beer. Now just a short distance away we have the Checkers Inn, it's just up here. Now we look upon the Checkers Inn. Canudan's Checkers Inn is now a private residence, but once a popular pub with cyclists who would stop here. And back in 1799 the parish clergymen met here over the new school plans. By 1796, John Trussler would teach reading, writing and arithmetic to, ch to 20 children here. And so in 1799, Mr Robertson would build Canudan's purpose-built school. It would cost £155 and today it's known as Vicarage Cottage. Now we are back at St Nicholas's Church and we're coming under law and order. So Canudan is unusual in Essex, it still has its original wooden cage, right here. Built in 1775 to detain people involved in drunkenness, violence, theft and petty crimes. 
Now afterwards they would be transported to the nearest magistrate's court for trial. So in 1914 this cage was moved from the pond and set up alongside the school gates. Then in 1938 it was moved here where it's been ever since. Here we can see the original shackles. Or well, iron straps to keep that door closed. Now I read that or read that inside uh, still the village stocks and the original whipping posts that survive. Morning. No, it's fine. Now we race forward to World War II and Canoodon would play its very important role for it would be home to one of Britain's first radar stations. Now by 1938 a series of 240 feet metal towers were built right here and they were known as RAF Canoodon. They would link up with 20 other stations and they would help defeat the enemy aircraft and allow the RAF to scramble and intercept the approaching bombers. Now we should talk about Wallasey Island, which is not far from Canoodon. The land slopes from Canoodon and forms the marshlands of Wallasey Island. And these lands have always suffered from sea floods. And in ancient times they were used to graze sheep. But in 1953, gale force winds and high tides caused the great flood which swamped Wallasey Island. Now RAF Canoodon were called with the code name King Canute and the flood was now active and 500 servicemen were drafted in to shore up the flood defences with sandbags. Wallasey Island itself would be one of the last parts of England to be drained of salt water and today the island is one of England's biggest wetland projects for birds and a walker's paradise. So now we're facing the lovely church itself and we shall talk about it more. So now we face St Nicholas's Church. The walls are made from ragstone rubble mixed with septaria and flint. And the dressings are of limestone. Now I discovered that septaria is a shellfish that once lived in fast flowing rivers about 70 million years ago. And now it is infused in St Nicholas's Church walls. It's fascinating stuff. Now we begin with the south porch, which is early 15th century. So the outer archway has moulded and shafted jams with such incredible wear. On the outer archway a moulded shaft, oh sorry, I'm, sorry I've got that, on the outer side we have the face shields. And again you can see they're much weathered and defaced. As we rise above we can just make out the original arch and the battlements at the top. And they have canapered flint work. Now the outer door itself, I've got no date on this. Let us go inside. Just before we do, if we look at the door, you can see countless generations of pinholes where notice has been put on the door. The 
tiny door handle. Now set in the floor. We have many grave markers which may be from the Jennings family of the 17th and 18th century who were church wardens here. We look up above. This porch is unusual in its flat pitched roof rested on the main oak timbers. If we look below we've got this lovely old copper lamp. Now if we look at the windows these are unblocked which from the rubble of countless century and are restored in 1901. Now the inner doorway is built identical to that of the out of the outer doorway, and you can just make out a lot on the left shield. Just about make out some detail. Let's just ma just notice some detail in one of the grave markers. On the floor. Okay, if I take my cap off, and we shall go inside. So we're going to go through another set of doors, which are modern pine. You can see the notices there. And now we've got a further door. This is an old door. And if we pan around we shall see the view from the south door. Let's look at the huge ledger stone on the floor. Now we can see the interior of this incredible doorway. Now this door is unusual in it has hinges running down the middle originally allowing it to be split. So now we're standing in the nave which measures 56 feet by 22 feet. It's an incredible church with a lot of character. Just look at the roof. We're looking at the original 15th century plain king posts and trusses which survive unchanged. Saying that the third beam is inscribed 18, uh, sorry, 1698 of a repair. Now 
Now, in this year, 1698, King William III opens the House of Commons in Westminster, London. Now, if we go back around to the south door, and above the doorway, we can see a coat of arms. Just look at the fine and ornate framework. So this, coat, this royal coat of arms is for King George II of 1759. Now George II loved music and would be patron to Handel and he would die only one year after this coat of arms was hung. Now if you just think that the coronation played Zadok the priest by Handel. Now if we look at the small boards just to the left, these are the vicars of Canudan. I counted 52 vicars, priests and rectors at Canudan. Just think about that, 52. Now if we move over to the right hand side, we can see a font. Now that we have two fonts here, but this one is 19th century. Now if we move over to the right side of the font, we have a memorial bench. And this is the first I've ever seen inside a church. You can see all the brass plates there remembering those that are no longer with us. Now we're facing the West Tower itself, which we cannot go inside. And there's a viewing platform up there for the bell ringers. Now, if we go over here, there's a small photograph directly in front of us. And you can see there's a small library area. Now, this photograph is panoramic. You can see the village from the tower. See the new village there? You can see how it's set up on a hill. This will be the access we came in by. Directly above us we can see the split beam that was repaired in 16... Is it 98? Now before 1902, this church had so many odd shaped pews and these were all replaced with chairs. Several survive today. Now in 1989, these pews were donated from St Peter's Church of London. This church I read was designed by Sir Christopher Wren. Now by chance at nearby Pagglesham Church, I found exactly the same pews as these, with the motifs on Now the nave is separated from the north aisle by these four columns and bays from the 14th century. Now if we take this column for example, 
The outer order springs from carved figures. We have a woman's head and a beast and a bird. And they hold a shield, believed to be that of Robert Braybrook, Bishop of London, who was nominated in 1381. This was the same year of the Peasants' Revolt, and Braybrook would also be Chan Lord Chancellor to Richard II in Ireland and was buried in St Paul's Cathedral. If we look over to the south wall, we've got a lovely south window. Above the lovely flowers, we can just make out some medieval glass to the left side. If we look on either side, we've got funeral hatchments, which will be these squares, the square boards here. Now, a funeral hatchment would hang outside of the deceased family's home and then it would be brought in here. Now, the black side shows the partner who has died and the grey side shows the spouse that still lives. But if we look onto the south wall, the hatchment there, we can see that the both the husband and wife are deceased in this funeral hatchment. And you can see on the shield the two families for their crest. I'd like to show you this much weathered seal, window seal, just in front of us. I can only imagine this is due to the harsh environment here with the salty air. You know, especially in the medieval period when there wasn't much glass in here. Now if we move around to the north side of the nave, we've got this lovely pulpit. Now this is a lovely, very fine oak pulpit, again with the London connection. This is from Sir Christopher Lee Stock Church in the City of London, 1670. Now that old church was levelled in 1781 to make way for the Bank of England. This church was also designed by Christopher Wren soon after the Great Fire of London. I can't resist going up and having a little look at the view. Okay, now we shall walk towards the North Isle.
Now the north aisle measures 11 feet wide and it's 14th century. So this is the oldest part of Canudan's church. Outside we have Roman bricks into the wall and the east window just up there is seriously old. I believe it's from 1270 and we shall see in a minute. Let's just have a little look around. Now here are the chairs from the original uh, church when they when they uh, remove the pulp, uh, the pew, can't think of the word, the chairs, benches, mine's gone blank, pews, that's the word I was trying to think of. Now we are looking at incredibly old font, the main font, this is 1300 or earlier, described as a polypod early English square bold font. Now this font was donated from Shoplands Church near South End on Sea, which was demolished in 1957. We can see some of the incredible detail and damage that's sustained over the centuries. It's over 700 years old. This is a fine view on the east side. Now the priest's step, I'm not sure if it's a headstone or it's purposely built. If, if we look on the north side, we've got these fleurs de lis. That's pronounced right. Graffiti. Now this was associated with France, used by the royalty and saints of France itself. There's a clear one there. And you see this incorporated into our flags and royal banners. And this very this may very well uh, date back to the time of Henry V when he married into France. Are we going to look at this board on the wall? Now this is a donations board. Many kind people donated to charity around 1818 and obviously way before that. And this lists their donations in money and land. And here we can see the parish chest. Now it's seen better days, this old chest, but this is an early Georgian parish chest with two locks, which would hold the church register and documents. Now, Canudan had many missing chests. I've actually got a book that lists all the chests that were listed here in 1916. And we had a little box, and it was a circular box for the poor and their funerals. And there would be a chain secured to the waist girdle, preventing any person from snatching it away. There was also a money chest. It was an iron-strapped oak strong box. And in 1913, inside was found a whalebone, 
said to have come from King Canute's knee bone. Now there was also a bone box. It was painted white. It was in oak and it was used to store the bones from Canudan's churchyard. Now we're facing this fine organ from 1878. It's a beautiful English chamber organ from the chapel of St Paul's Cathedral in London. Can you imagine that? Now before 1904, this organ resided at Great Stanbridge's church. And we can see paintings of angels based on the Sunday school girls from there in the year 1900. If we look above, we can see more paintings. So now I believe we're looking at the Memorial Chapel. And I believe this east window here is the oldest. It's 1270. In this year 1270, Parliament levies a property tax to support the Eighth Crusade in Tunisia. Now as you can see, this section of the church is dedicated to those that made the ultimate sacrifice in World War I and two and all the other wars we've been involved in. So look at this window in the North Wall. Now in 1919 this fine window was commissioned remembering the 11 men who made the ultimate sacrifice during World War I. And if we look at the very base we can see their names. We will we'll remember them. Now the three panels of glass show St George to the left, patron saint of England and the, and the army. The Spurs. St. Michael represents the Royal Air Force. Got the fine robes. Reminds me of the coronation, actually. And Michael is barefoot. And we have St Michael, the patron saint of sailors and the Royal Navy. Massive connection to this village. You can see IHS, the monogram of Jesus on his mitre. If we look to the right side, we've got two ancient niches, niches which are fascinating to examine. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this niche would have been dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Notice the seven red stars. You can just make them out. Now, this could be connected to the book of Revelation, where it is written, a woman clothed with the sun 
and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Medieval churches must have been very colourful and pictorial. We go down, we can see some more. The only way is to get up close yourself and have a look. But this would have definitely been a shrine. Now if we look below, we can see the ancient Piscina. Look at that, fantastic. Now this is early 15th century and it was used for washing the holy vessels. If we look to the right side, I'm really not sure what this is. could be a very ancient squint so you could see the altar. Now here's something else interesting. On the floor lays the original altar stone and their con consecration crosses are carved at each corner. Sometimes I feel like Indiana Jones. little look. There it is. Now it's likely it was removed during the dissolution of the monasteries for its own protection. If found it would have been smashed, although it has got a massive crack running down the middle. It was discovered in a barn at the old vicarage during the 1900s. Now I've returned the old banner, the chair, the De Chanso altar. Now it's interesting that John De Chanso held Canudens Manor in 1289. He held the North Marsh here, including Pagglesham. Could this have been the family altar in 1289? Now we've moved over to the chancel, which measures 34 feet by 19 feet. And it's early 14th century. Now today's chancel arch was constructed in 1894 when the wooden beam was removed. Now foundations were discovered here showing a much earlier arch. Now the original roof was replaced in 1894 by the lay minister Hunter Little. So I've put the lights on to treat myself so we can see what we can see better. Didn't sound very right in English, did it? There. Let's move forward a little bit. Just have a little look around. I believe these are the choir pews. Got various memorials. Now we're looking at South Wall. We've got various quite large memorials on this side. Double height window. the high altar there. Now if we look over to the south wall, I believe this to be a tabernacle. Now it's 15th century and it's described as shafts of a tabernacle and also painted head belonging to the same work, 15th century. Now if you get up close you can see the original vivid colours of dark green, red and gold. Now this would have been used as a locked box to store the reserved sac sacrament, sacrament and the bread and wine for Mass. 
Now, if we go over to the north wall, we can see the original priest door behind that small organ there. Now, incredibly, this is the original 1380 priest door, which led to the Topham family side chapel. It was blocked up in 1894. And yes, this very small and cute, is that the right word, organ built by church warden Martin Adcock, who built this organ from a kit in the 1970s. And yes, it still works. Although saying that, I think the first pipe looks a bit crook. But look at that, it's quite, quite amazing, isn't it? You can make something from a kit. I wonder what it sounds like. Maybe they'll play it sometime. Now, if we look beneath us, we've got this lovely communion um, kneeler, or prayer kneeler, I guess it is. It's all the way across. Uh, and it's the only one I've ever seen so far in all the churches. So this altar rail kneeler was designed and made and presented by Sybil Webster in 1995. And what a talented, talented work of art it is. You can see it captures some of what I captured on the video today. So village life, all the, all the roads and streets. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Oh, you can see it took one year. It's a bit wobbly because I'm holding the camera. Um, yeah, Canoodon <clears throat> is a great place for walking, so if you recommend bring your walking boots and a map, come out here. So we shall now look at the east window. So this east window is in memory of C. Hardy of 1924, who was vicar here for 22 years. Many trumpeters. And the Reredos has got the Lord's Prayer, Exodus. And I'm not sure what else it's got. But if we look to the right hand side, We have an early 15th century piscina, which has a broken drain. Just think Henry V may have witnessed Mass here himself.
Now, if we look above the piscina, we can see a shield of arms or shield of arms set in stone, the shield of arms of the de Chancel family. Consists of a chevron and three rings. Now, this ancient family left Chanceau in France and settled in Devon in 1086. After settling in Canudan in 1289, they would also hold Rochford, Wakerin, Pagsham and Hockley. Now, I'm just wondering if the piscina has been carved out from a memorial stone as it has no recess. And this would be the sedilia where the priest would sit. Now returning to the Exodus, the Exodus in which the Israelites leave slavery in biblical Egypt and would follow Moses to Mount Sinai, believed to be in Saudi Arabia and not Egypt. Experts on this to this day. I'm not sure, 100%. Okay, if we look at the view of the chancel itself, sorry, not the chancel, the nave. Now we're going to walk to the west tower, through the chancel and the nave. Now this church is normally locked, um, but they do carry out services and so on. And they have a lot of to do with the bell ringing. So it's best to look online for events. But I was told by a local they're absolutely fantastic to listen to. Now we're going to look closer at this oak screen. Now this was donated by the Young family in the 1950s in memory of their father, William Joseph Young, 1943. Now the Young family fished white bait for centuries off the coast of Leon Sea, where they would trade at Billingsgate Fish Market in London. And there's actually a documentary on YouTube. If we look at the floor here, I read that this could be a 12th century baptism font of some sort. You can see the drainage up in the centre there. So now we're going to make our way outside. Notice they've got a book that's recommended in the history. That's a visitor's book. Well, look at this lovely old door. So let's talk about bells.
An incredible total of 15 bells sit in the bell chamber above. The oldest is a 1634 bell cast by Miles Gray I of Colchester Foundry. Now nine years later, Miss Miles, Mr. Miles described himself as being weak in body and crazed with age, but yet in perfect mind and memory. The next bell was cast by John Whaler in 1707. It was cast at the Rochford Foundry, so not far from here, and there would be three John Whalers, and all from Royden in Essex.